Well, we're making a big transition here today. We're moving to uh, the third priority. We've finished uh, priority one and priority two in our study through the four priority book. Um, the first priority we said was a personal progressive commitment to Jesus Christ. And that is foundational for all the rest of this study on the four priorities. And I think almost, uh, I was telling some of our staff today that I think the thing that I think we need to get over here very clearly is that Jesus Christ and that first priorities really needs to be at the center of all the rest of these priorities. And they need to impact all the other priorities, priority two, priority three, and priority four. So please keep that in mind and see that these are not segregated things where you got priority one and you got priority two, priority three, and priority four, and they stand alone. They don't stand alone. Jesus Christ, that first priority, needs it to be at the very center of them all. Very important that you see that. As we get into this whole uh, third priority, which is a personal progressive commitment to the, to the body of Christ and to your relationships, I want to help, you, help us to understand the significance of this. Um, we need to ask the question, perhaps, why are we here? If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then the Bible gives us the answer to why we're here. Our purpose in life, number one, is to love him. Matthew chapter number 22, verse 37 through 39, Jesus said the great command, the number one priority is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Number one. And that number one priority or purpose in life is to permeate all the rest of our life. But if that purpose is my purpose and his purpose for me, then how should that be lived out? Well, it's to be lived out in relationships. The way you can evaluate how you're loving the Lord is, are you loving people? Are you caring deeply for people? And that's going to move us right into this first uh, part of the third priority, which is how to make your marriage sizzle. We're going to do uh, our little time together today, and then I'll continue that again next week uh, in this uh, third priority. How do you make your marriage sizzle? Um, someone uh, by the name of George Leonard in a book called The Man and Woman Thing said this. He said, we can orbit the earth and touch the moon, yet this society has not devised a way for a man and a woman to live together for seven straight days with any assurance of harmony and personal growth. Wow, it is a challenge. And if you're married, you know it is. If you're not married, you may not want to get married because you see people not doing very well in their marriage. Let me give you a couple thoughts, then I want to read something rather humorous. Uh, when people get married, you got two individuals that come together. And when those two individuals come together, they bring with them individual expectations. When I do marriage counseling, uh, all premarital counseling and marriage counseling, I always ask the couples, what are your expectations? Because one of the top two things that I deal with in marriage counseling over the years is I'm frustrated because the things that I desire, the things that I want, the expectations that I had when we got married, they're not being met. One of the little tips I might add here is don't expect your husband or your wife to be a mind reader. You need to articulate what those expectations are. You need to go over them again and again and again. I heard a woman say one time, a wife say one time, well, he, if he loves me, he ought to know what I want. Don't assume that. We're slow learners. We need you to repeat it for us. So expectations we bring in there. Um, we bring in desires. Uh, we all have desire for what we want in a relationship. Uh, we all bring hurts. Maybe hurts out of the family we grew up in, personal hurts and deficiencies in our own lives. But those hurts are part of the package. Uh, we bring scars. We bring needs. And there are a lot of needy people. And often we think, well, if I just get married, then all my needs will be met. And, and he'll meet them or she'll meet them. Listen, let me just say this. There is no man or woman on the planet that can ever fulfill and meet all your needs 100%, 100% of the time. It's impossible. And that's why we go back to what Jesus said. He said, your number one priority is to love me first. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He is the only one that can sufficiently meet your needs. 
So that's the first thing. The secondly, the models for marriage today are kind of crazy. You know, you look at television, you look at the media, and in our day and time today, you know, often the, the, the models for marriage are so distorted uh, and people make fun of marriage and aren't proponents of marriage anymore, or they're proponents of some other kind of um, mixture of marriage that uh, is absolutely contrary to what the scripture teaches. And then there are friends that we have, friends that, uh, you know, they've been married three or four times, and maybe your own parents, your own family you grew up in. I grew in a family, up in a family, my mom and dad were divorced when I was two years old. So you got that going for you. I remember one time uh, uh, doing a marriage in Orlando, Florida. And the marriage was outside in the back of this beautiful home on a lake. And so uh, time came for the, the, for the ceremony to start. And I'm down by the lake and I'm maybe five feet from the edge of the water and the lake's behind me. And I'm looking up at the house and this beautiful lawn and chairs have been set up and the violins are playing. It's a beautiful afternoon in Orlando, Florida. So I'm getting, the couple comes down and I'm getting ready to start the, the, the little uh, ceremony when this noise behind me again grows louder. And obviously it's a boat. Uh, and I'm thinking, well, certainly these people will be uh, uh, kind enough to see what's going on and turn away before they get too close. Well, they were getting closer. They were getting closer. They were getting closer. So finally, I mean, I thought the thing was coming up my back. So I turned around and looked behind me. It's like 30, 40 feet away. And it's getting ready to make this big turn. And the wake is coming up on shore. And everybody's focused on the boat. There are probably 10 or 12 people on this boat. they are all got their big uh, cooters light in their hand. And one of the guys, as they turn, as they're pulling away, cups his hand and he yells, don't do it, man. You're making a big mistake. Well, it was pretty hard to proceed after that. Uh, marriage is under stress today. There's mobility. I mean, if you ask in the average crowd where I speak, how many of you have moved in the last 10 years, you'll get at least 50% of the people that have moved in the last year. Uh, work pressure. There are affairs. There's affluent. affluent. The problem uh, with affluence in certain society. Uh, sections of our society and cities, uh, it creates all kinds of problems because the affluence then moves to boredom and boredom, some of the biggest mistakes we make is when we're bored. The pressure of children, uh, the pressure that comes with unexpected things like crises and illness, uh, aging parents and the financial crisis, all of that. So it's a trick to pull these things off and to be successful. John 17, Jesus, the night before he goes to the cross, says this, praying to the Father. He says, and you sent me into the world. I also have sent them, the disciples, into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified by my truth. The word sanctified means to be set aside for your originally designed purpose. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one as we are one, you and me and I and you, that they may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. In the glory which you have sent me, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may be made perfect and that the world, that means the non-believer, may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. So Jesus, the night before he goes to the cross, prays to the Father and says, Father, the thing that I want more than anything is that that, that true believers of all times would love not only us, but they would love one another because they, but because they love me, us, and because they love one another, that they, they will impact the world around them who are filled with people who don't know us. And so what he's saying here is that the key for people around us coming to know Jesus is by looking at us and how much we love the Lord and how much we love each other. And this applies right into marriage. And let me just conclude by saying this. Uh, marriage is to be a model on earth of what heaven is like. So if that's true, then, are you being the husband that God wants you to be? Are you being the wife that the Lord wants you to be? Well, there's a lot at stake here. You think about that real hard. 
Thanks for listening to the Four Priorities Podcast. This podcast, along with the Four Priorities book, are designed to aid, support, and encourage you in your work of making disciples. If you haven't purchased your copy of the Four Priorities, you can do so at www.thetolstongroup.com. Please subscribe to this podcast and follow John on social media for more resources and teaching. See you next time on the Four Priorities Podcast.